Մոգես ալմեպիտ, դիդի մատլոբա մոբրձան է բիստույս, չեմ թույս դիդի պատևի արով Մոգես ալմոտ տավիսուպալի ունիվերսիտետի սախելիտ, մեր Սարդաշորիս է որդերթովով բիսկոլիս տեկ այնդինատին կարոսանից է, դա չվենք տավազոպտ դղես ճայիկաստան էրթատ շեմուշավելուլի կուրսիս պրեզենտացիս պիրվել լեկցիաս, ձալիան դիդի մատլոբա ճայիկաս, իապոնի Սարդաշորիսոմնը ես խովոլթվիս, կանսակութր է բուլի մադրովա, չու ենց պրոպեսորս, ռոմելից տղես արմուատ կենց լեկցի աստա ամազ է ուկ է մոգույան է բիտի սավոբրեպեն, կիտե վերտխլ դիդի մադլովա, իմ է դիմակցրույես կուրսի ռոմելի � Մի ինդ արամդենի մեզ սիտխույթ ստխովոր, ոմ ծարդկես չու ենց ինաշե, չու ենց ռեկտորս, բատոնում ատոլ է ժավաս, ռոմելի ծարիս տավիսուպալի դա ագրարուր, ինվորսեպս ռեկտորի, բատոնում աղթանք տխոտ։ Հոտ զալ մարդալի է ես պորմատի արիս ճայիկ աս պարգլեպշի, անում եպոնիս գամի թարեմի սագենտոս պարգլեպշի, թումցա թավրովիս ռոմելսա ծայլչոց արմոտ գես պոլիտիկ ուրիմ խարդաճարիս գարեշե, ծխադի է այսետի պորմատեմի վեր Եապոնիս գամիթարևիս Սայլչոստան դա Սայլչոստան Սակարտոլոշի, դա գոնիարով չվեն իմ խրիդան ասաց ուակ էտեպտ, առամարդով նիշոլովանի է Եապոնի իսատույս, առամետ ու նիշոլովանի է իմ իսատույսրով չվեն ախալ Սամկարոս ուպրո մրավալ պերոնը տաղի կովդետ, հած տկենի կանատլեպիս դա տկենի կարիերուլից եսուլի սապուծվելի չէ լեմը գաղտես, առամարդո ծնովիս մողարյովիս դա սակմակովել ուպրա, տարամետ սրուլիած պրագմատուլի միզնե� Ամիտ մինդա այս ուտքոտ դավասուլո չէ մի կամոսուլա, Ուելքամ, Եոր Եկսելենսի, այվ պրեմիսիս, մի ապրիշիտ այն այլի այլի պոլիտիկլ սպորտ, մի այլի 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 � history we will be uh, witnessing uh, in the lecture, but uh, still, I say, um, modern, I mean, Georgia is just three decades old, so this cooperation is already quite a history. So thank you very much, Professor Toda. Thank you very much you. for your time and uh, mm. your presence here, and mm. we are really Looking very much forward to the lecture you are <laughs> going to deliver. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. But on Elch Smindarov, Tchor, I'm Denny Messit with Your Excellency. If you just make a few remarks. I just uh, wanted to <laughs> thank you, Lector, and uh, your team for allowing uh, uh, Mr. Toda, and uh, he's a, a great JICA expert uh, who has been experiencing uh, many places uh, working in development nations. This, this lecture series uh, was a kind of brainchild of the former president of the uh, JICA, who I met when I was appointed to, as an ambassador to Georgia two years ago. And the first thing he asked me is, if Georgia is interested in our Japan's experience uh, in development, then uh, we're ready to do the lecture in one of the universities. And we knew that free university is the best 
place to do this because you have the best uh, uh, professors, the faculties and students uh, specializing in Japan and uh, adjacent areas. So w when we heard this proposal from the president, we immediately asked uh, my colleague uh, JICA uh, regional head, Mori-san, who is here, uh, to consider this proposal. And I'm very happy that the first lecture <laughs> by Mr. Professor Toda will be now beginning. So really like looking forward uh, I am also to this lecture, so thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Didi Madloba, Gadawi de Tuku Albat Lekciaze, Professor Itodas, Zarad Genschweni, Kustam Taurebuli, Sartashori Sortier to Biscolis. Ես առոտխատ կուրստամ թավրեպուլի, գիյորգի մելաշվելի, ռոմելի ծասեմ է չվեն թանասցավոլիս, սալեկցիո կուրսեպ, սարտաշորի սորդրդովս թեորի եպշի, դաշորի ուլի ագմուսավոլցիս իստորիաշի, դամ գոնիարոծ ալիան սայնտերեսոտ so first of all, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. It is a great pleasure and honor for us to see His Excellency Ambassador, the Rector, and of course, first and foremost, our students, the people for whom this lecture was designed, and the people because of whom Professor Toda came to Georgia from Japan. Um, I can read his biography, which is extremely impressive, but I believe it will not be the most interesting thing about Professor Toda. <laughs> due to my line of work and due to my cooperation with international organizations, our friends, I've seen lots of foreigners who come to Georgia. Many of them perceive this as a simple job assignment. They come to Georgia, they preach, and then they leave. Preach. <laughs> preach. But yesterday, we had a very yeah. nice conversation with Professor Toda. Mm. And this conversation actually demonstrated that this person who is standing here with us, he's not here just because of a job assignment. International work, and if you want to do this job well, requires not only professionalism, which you can look through in Professor Toda's biography, but also passion. And I was very happy that yesterday, during our conversation, I noticed this passion from Professor mm -hmm. Toda. Mm -hmm that his devotion and willingness to share Japanese knowledge, to share the experience of Japan, and also his eagerness to see Georgia a very successful country. So I think I will finish your introduction here. Mm -hmm. The students had an opportunity to look through a biography, so they already know oh, who they're talking oh, to. Okay, okay. Uh, and I would like to ask you mm. to talk. Yeah, Thank you. Not seen. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Georgi. Yeah. So, very good evening. And I feel very much honored with the presence of the uh, rector and dean of faculty and uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Imamura, and my colleague, Morrison. Uh, I'm here not for the purpose of giving or never preaching you a kind of lecture. Rather, I'm here to effectuate a kind of fruitful for both of us conversations for the sake of our common future between Georgia and Japan. That's the reason why I came here, not a remote one. I came here it's a very short travel, 8,000 kilometers, just on one flight. <laughs> and uh, I thought about what is the appropriate theme for both of us. And I decided to choose wisdom co-creation for a common future. And uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you, Okay, three questions to tackle with you. The first one is about the political morphology, which have been changed drastically 
of course, after and during the COVID. And especially after 1990s, after the collapse of Cold War, you have learned a lot about it. But let us very quickly summarize our lessons learned for our future. And the second one is our lessons learned from COVID-19. Um, having said that, the most important third question is our ingenuity, our intellectual wisdom to cope with so, so many problems and challenges Georgia is facing, Japan is facing. We have common challenges. And another commonality is that we have very limited resources. Now, Yang is being devaluated. <laughs> Georgia has difficulty of natural resources, financing, human resources, etc. In the midst of those sort of difficulties, what are the best options for our futures? This is what I want to work with you. And within uh, 60 minutes or maybe 90 minutes to the maximum, with you, it is a work with you to improve all together. Okay? Could you, could you cooperate with me? Fine? Especially youngsters, ne? please. Smile and proactive and vocal. But if you talk, please talk a bit concisely because our time is very precious. Okay, let's go. Before attacking the three questions, uh, I want to reiterate the importance of our global cooperation beyond boundaries. Japanese cooperation to this country is not merely simply a kind of charity or giving money or financing or some technology. No, no, no. It's outdated. It's outdated. It is still to some extent useful, but this excellent country needs something more, something more important. And what I can bring, and what JICA, and what Japan can bring, is our experience, our own experience of development, which are not necessarily a kind of boastful success stories, which you heard a lot. For example, 1985, Japan won China. 1905, Japan beaten Russia, and etc., etc. No, th not those kind of things. Rather, uh, Japan is in time or as well, struggling for evacuating ourselves from the three decades of stagnation. So, including this sort of lessons learned, we'd like to share with you. The another as aspect of the usefulness or the value of our cooperation is that our global but modest experience all over the world. For example, uh, during my 37 years of career, I visited almost all the so-called developing countries. Unfortunately, I have to apologize. This is the first time for me to be in Georgia. Georgia is my 116th country to visit. Excellent country. But crystallizing those experiences, lessons learned, success stories, as well as failures, to be applied, to be contextualized to the situation of Georgia. Georgia is a very difficult and complex situation, as well as in Japan. But to some extent, Japan's modest experience would be useful and pro productive to you, especially for youngsters. Okay, let us proceed. Maybe this kind of child you are familiar 
this is a uh, global morphology of so-called democratizations globally. And what have you learned from this sort of global tendency? Especially, please have a look at, close look at the drastic change after 1991 and somewhere around 2001. And now, so I wonder some of you can support me to make a progress on this lecture. What's the impression? What have you learned from this one? Oh. Yeah. Be oh courageous. You're the first cooperator. So what have I learned from this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anything is fine. Uh, I think that... Uh, it's uh, the differences between the uh, economical strengths oh. depended on the years or periods of mm, world history. Oh. And other things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What's your name? Nika. Nika. Thank you, Nika. Yeah. Any other guys? Volunteers? Okay. Good. Four of here think that yeah. uh, between 1991 and 2001, there the number of countries that are going that were democratizing uh, rose very fast yeah. and dramatically. Yeah. Though that time period coincides with the fall of the Soviet Union in Yugoslavia. Exactly. exactly. However, however, yeah. however, it can also be said that after those uh, countries had fallen. Uh. Uh, the countries reverted to being autocratic yet again, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, just yeah, yeah, went yeah, yeah, yeah. back, and now yeah. we have a situation where the tendency is reversed. Mm. So could it really be said that those countries were really democratizing in the first place? Excellent, excellent. Can I have your name? Alex. Huh? Alex. Alex, Alex. Excellent, Alex. Yes, this is more than perfect. So the morphology regarding autocratization and democratization, as Alex rightly said, exactly uh, what we remarked. But the point is why? And what is inside this sort of superficial observations? I don't want to scrutinize democracy here. I need to go back to Japanese experience as quickly as possible. But important thing, one thing is relativize the value of democracy by visiting uh, our old friend, such as Carl Schmitt. You know him. Carl Schmitt defined democracy in the shortest way. It's an identity or identification of the ruler and ruled, the shortest definition of democracy. But he also pointed out, after experience, Weimar emperor and Nazis and democratization after World War II in Germany, he pointed out, not sarcastically, but in a, a bit scientific way, about the paradox of democracy. Sometimes, sometimes democracy would lead you to a different way from the people expected by people themselves. So it's all up to the people whether or not the democracy is effective and useful for people. That is a very important point. And this point should be remembered when we draw some sort of hypothetical conclusion after one hour from now. And the second remarks is on a kind of humor, British humor. Yeah. You may remember uh, Winston Churchill's this one. It's very interesting. It's really British, it's not Japanese. It's not Georgian, yeah. But we can pay due respect to his empirical remarks. Democracy 
might be the worst system, political system, but maybe better than any other system that we experience. I'm not sure whether or not it's true, but let's go on, okay. Yeah. Now, our superficial observation on the change of so-called democracy and autocratization. Let's see the content of changes, especially the contents of changes of increasing so-called autocratization systems. And if we scrutinize, that's based on the VDEM in Sweden, Swedish research, and also Freedom House have a similar results. How about that? You see, the first one, CSO repression, respect the counter-argument, harassment of journalists, these kind of things result in the increase of so-called autocracy or autocratization. Why, why, why? The important thing is not written here. Uh, legal system law, election. They are keeping, they are keeping those sort of system and framework. But unfortunately, after, at least after 10 years, after the Cold War collapse, these countries are not necessarily successful on satisfying these sort of indicators while they are keeping the so-called superficially democratic system. Okay. The, this sort of, how to say, widening gap between the superficial political system and the contents. And we need to fill the gap so that we see in a year ahead about the real progress of a democracy serving for the people. I expect many of you can agree with me that democracy serving for the people would be, to some extent, desirable. And Japan is also part of it. EU as well. United States, to some extent. I don't say not depending on parties and Georgia. Okay, so let's work on this. And uh, next one. When we look back Japanese history of painful democratization process, especially after major restoration, 1868, we had a difficulty of effectuating democracies. First of all, surrounded by so-called imperialism, we had had no choice to go for strengthening military and industrial capacities. But after gaining, to some extent, the level of economic prosperities, democracy started burgeoning in Japan. But unfortunately, we were not successful, at least before World War II. And then, the World War II put them to the devil. And we resisted. And we are fairly successful to democratize ourselves. And after the 1960s, we are very much brilliantly successful to continuously make an economic growth, as well as improve social equity, and substantiate democracy. Based on this experience, so-called democratic framework is not a precondition, is not the only precondition. We need, we need something else. We need something else. And uh, yes, because of time constraints, I have to be in a hurry to share with you the crystallized part of Japanese lessons learned is that 
our investment on human resources. Healthy, learned, modest, intellectual, devoted, committed, and peace-loving people are the real foundation of democracy and the real foundation of our development, socio-economic development. That is what I want to say and what I want to vindicate as a Japanese who suffered from poverty. I was born in 1960 and I was in a very, very poor family. But unfortunately, because of democratic system, I was able to go to university and I was able to work for the country like this. This is because of Japanese democracy. And I think you are also endowed to get the marvelous opportunity to learn here, the marvelous university. But not for everybody, but everybody should enjoy this sort of right. For that purpose, please remember, superficial framework setting is not enough at all. We need, in order that our peace-loving, stable, and prosperity-heading democracy be effectuated. We need human resources. We need human beings. And we need constructive and reasonable and friendly relationship among us. OK. Let's proceed to the next question. You remember, learning from COVID-19. And this fear, when I found that, was very much shocking for me. Because I've been working for the prosperity of so-called developing countries, but these facts after COVID-19 destroyed my belief in development. Could you, could you explain my miserable feeling when I see this chart? Could you try? Please. Or what can you learn from this chart? Uh, we can say the GDP and the current international mm, dollars from the chart and where the, uh, different countries stand uh, in the uh, with the uh, capacity of the death uh, during the COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Japan is somewhere in between, I guess. Huh. That's okay. what we are capable to see on the chart. Thank you. What's your name? Tamar. What's your name? Tamar. Tamar-san. Hi. Tamar, thank you. Yeah. So uh, being polite as Japanese, we call it san, eh? So in case of Tama, I call Tama-san, ne? and my name Toda. So you call me. When you respect me, Toda-san, OK? And if you don't, Toda, it's fine. <laughs> OK. It's not causality. It's just a co hypothetical coefficient between the richness in terms of GDP per capita and the number of deaths caused by COVID-19. Very simply, becoming rich does not protect you. Becoming rich in terms of GDP might not be the perfect goal post for so-called developing countries. We need something else, something else to reinforce our re resilience to protect our family, protect our lives. We need something else. The next one, please. Another shocking one, in a positive way this time, is elderly people died more. But one exceptional case, which is Japan, Japan is the most aged society, as you know well. Yeah. 
I'm not Ezra Vogel, so I should not say Japan as number one. It's no. But Japan as number one most aged society. This is true. Yakusen's Imamura agree. And so, on average, elderly people died. So, age society suffered more from COVID-19, naturally. But I'm not sure, but Japan is a bit rare case to protect aged people like me. Why? <laughs> you smile. I'm old. I, I'm older than all of you. Eh? Uh, maybe factor X should be scrutinized. Maybe Japan is not now demonstrating gorgeous trajectory of prosperity, unfortunately. But to some extent, when it comes to our resilience of saving the lives of elderly people, Georgia, as well as European countries, United States, might learn something from Japan's experience. Ah, make it simple. Japanese elderly people might be healthier than other countries' people. Like me. Look at me. I look young. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, the next one, please. This is uh, about uh, obesity, obesity. Yes, this is also about health. So, fat people die more because of COVID-19. So, by scrutinizing this data and the last one, maybe we can draw some sort of hypothetical lessons. If people are healthy, not fat enough, and taking more care of themselves, then society could enjoy the safety of their own lives and families. It's a hypothesis. It's not a scientifically vindicated yet, because COVID-19 has not ended yet. So we need to, yes, vindicate after uh, the completion of this sort of uh, unhappiness, but probably uh, we can tentatively and hypothetically think that uh, becoming healthy, having healthy people might increase the resilience of society. Okay? okay the last one. Urban population. When I was young, like you, urbanization is a kind of goal post. To work in urban city with fashionable suits and drink everywhere, night, going to disco, dance halls, going to see opera. It's a kind of symbol of richness and prosperity. But when you pursue the urbanization, urban population increase, that's also increases, hypothetically, the risk of having more deaths in the society, the risk of having more fragility in the society. So just only just visiting four simple chart, you may have changed the morphology of your goalpost. When I was young like you, the goalpost was very simple. Okay, let's go for growth, economic growth. Let's double GDP per capita within 10 days. No, not 10 days, 10 years. And let's harmonize. Light everywhere, energy everywhere. But COVID-19 tells us simply some sort of intellectual skepticism on that simple way 
of having a dream. So my dream in my youth is much, much simpler than your dream you should have for your future. Your dream, you have dream, but your dream might be a little bit complex than mine. Okay, next one, please. Sorry, sorry, Gheorghe, <laughs> professor. <laughs> okay, so having uh, Japanese lessons learned and having a kind of very quick survey on uh, global morphology of COVID-19, as I said, becoming rich might, might not only the only solution for resilience of society, and healthy people might be the key. And the third one I didn't mention is about the drastic change of Great Reset, STI, Science and Technology Innovation, accelerated by the COVID-19. So even in this lecture, some of you are enjoying remote lecture listening. And this sort of planetary friendly activities accelerated by COVID-19. So everything, every risk could be the opportunity for improving ourselves. Okay, please. Okay. Hi. So, very quickly speaking, I would like to suggest to you three things when you make a dream as a global leader, as a leader of at least this country. First one is investing in the people. Firstly, for having better, mature political system. I would not say democracy, but to some extent, some open and free and paying due respect political system should be and could be constructed by human beings. So why not more investment in human beings? And the second one might be a bit complicated. This is my modest, part of my modest question, uh, answers to the third question. In the midst of so many, so many difficulties with very, very limited scarce resources, what shall we do? That was the question. And my modest answer, part of my answer is this one. Make full use of shareable resources. What do you mean by shareable resources? For example, how much money do you have? In your banking account. 20,000. Privacy, sorry. Okay. <laughs> More than one trillion? Nobody. If you have one trillion, you can share. Yeah, you can share. Yes, just, on a, just on before COVID-19, I talked with Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates is very much influential, not only for IT, but also health sector. I feel shame of talking to you that uh, Bill Gates' money to the global health is two and a half times bigger than Japanese government's contribution, unfortunately. So uh, I was obliged to, yes, call him friend and ask him collaboration. But that's okay. But anyway, for m most of us, including me, money is not shareable resources. I cannot share with you money, unfortunately, sorry. Also, I have a very modest credit card, but uh, Monthly limitation, very much miserable one. But we also have shareable resources. You know, what do you mean by shareable resources? Wisdom, yes, the topic of this session. Knowledge, of course. 
Friendship. We shall have friendship. Although I ask you a nasty question. Sorry, I apologize. Those kind of things are terrible. Picking up knowledge, information, technology, or wisdom. When I share with you, shall I lose something? When I share my most important knowledge with you, shall I lose something? Maybe I can gain your respect to me, and I'll be happy. Or maybe you can rectify my knowledge so I can increase the value of my wisdom. So youngsters, let us be aware of the importance and the infinite capacity of shareable resources to be utilized in a resource scarcity setting, which Japan has done to the maximum extent, especially after the 1960s, for economic growth as well as social equity. So what I and other lecturers are going to share with you is this point. Very important point. Georgia, including uh, brilliant professors, no, no, you can continue, you can continue. I should. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm talking about uh, your attractiveness, no? uh, because uh, I'm not asking. I'm not yeah. going to win the beauty contest, <laughs> let's make it true. Attract, intellectual attractiveness, I said, I said, yes, I, I, I drank with him, Last night, then, uh, I was so much impressed by the brilliant power of young sons. His age is a bit younger than a little bit, ne? a little bit of uh, 34 years. Ne? Oh. But yes, you have these guys and you. And if you collaborate with each other, you, yeah, your productivity potential enormous. Yeah. Wisdom revolution. And the last one. Emphasis on versatile capacity and collaborate with others. This is also what we have done in Japan when we are in a miserable poverty. Taking one example. Sanitation. When we were very poor, for example, 100 years ago, we have so many, so many health troubles, contagious diseases. And the first thing we have done is clean up the ditches. Instead of, instead of importing from United States and Europe expensive uh, equipment machineries, we ask community people to clean up ditches and review the nutrition which poor people have. Nutrition, sanitation, those are the very much versatile. And also we put a strong emphasis on mother and child health. Because if you are in the difficulties under age five, that's bad effects prolong until the end of your life. So emphasis on those versatile measures, regardless the unknown risks, could be the optimum solution for the poor, for the poor country. I don't want to say poor in spirit, but the poor material, poor financial. I can say that because I was poor. I can say that because Japan was miserably poor, surrounded by so many potential enemies who want to invade Japan. Yeah. But we survived. And we went to the top prosperity. And we are still keeping our stability, regardless of the risk and the influence of gigantic neighboring countries. 
So why not Georgia? Georgia is around, I should not mention them specifically the name of country, but you should also safeguard yourselves, your dignities. But how? They are too huge. Some of them are too influential. And you cannot control them, maybe. But if you make full use of vers your versatile measures, as well as your shareable resources, you may be the effective counter power of those threats. So let's work on that. Georgi, sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor. Yeah. So what JICA has been doing on better governance, it will, I, I will do it very quickly. Eh? Not only central level, but also local and community level. And when you say governance, most of you can imagine a kind of democratization process, uh, free and fair election, legislation, etc. Those things are important, but the most importantly, I should put emphasis uh, once again and again and again about human resources. And another thing which differentiates Japan from World Bank, United Nations, I don't want to criticize them because I have so many friends, and even Japanese are also working, so many Japanese are working there. So. But one of the modest advantage of, for you to deal with Japan bilaterally is this. We Japanese have experience of our own struggle and of assisting other countries' struggle based on our experiences. And those sort of experiences, lessons learned, should be duly contextualized to Georgian situation. Okay, Professor, next one. Thank you. And also, I need to talk about peace. What is peace? What is peace for you? Okay. First of all, thank you for giving me a word. My name is Nina. Yeah. Uh, as you know, peace is the main thing in the world, personally for me. Mm. Uh, it's a guarantee of happy living. And happy, yeah. Happy living, yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know how to say it correctly, like, how do you say it? Hmm? Yeah, uh, quality of life is better when okay, peace is okay. there in our country. Okay, good. Thank you so good. much. Good, thank you. Quality of life. Yes. You're enjoying. <laughs> thank you, yes. So from an academic viewpoint, yes. Uh, uh, we can uh, anatomize the quality of life to uh, two ways. One is fulfillment of justice and Arabic, and Israel, and uh, some other languages have a strong connotation of justice when they pronounce uh, peace. And uh, another axis of peace is what? It's an uh, absence of violence. And this connotation prevails, uh, especially in uh, Eastern Asia, such as Japan and China. Uh, so for the quality life, we need both. Justice should be fulfilled without violence. But unfortunately, justice differs. Your justice might not be the justice for the others. Yeah. And in most cases, that is a cause of conflict, especially picking up the territorial issues. Now, you have 20% of your territory deposited to your northern neighbor. Yeah? What is justice? I don't know. I cannot politicize my argument. But my point is that 
justice differs. So peace building is not simply easy. It's not a simple task of moving something from A to B. That's not peace building. Peace building is a very, very complex approach. We need a multifaceted approach. And let me introduce very quickly the most important philosophy or how do you say, notion of Japanese foreign policy, which is called human security. Human security, by definition, is protecting vital core of human beings. What do you mean by vital core? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Maybe I can speak with this. No, no, no. no? Just the... uh, okay, okay. Huh? It's, okay, okay, thank you. And what is vital core human beings? Life, livelihood, and dignities. How? Of course protect, but the best way to protect is empower themselves. This is very important. This is very important. So many rich countries look down upon poor countries and they want to sell some ideas. But that's not the way. Japan, which used to be very poor and weak and fragile, we have genetically implanted memory of being poor, fully understand the necessity of paying due respect to the respective countries. This handbook is a combination of, how to say, pregnant ladies' handbook and babies' handbook. Pregnant ladies' handbook, which is called Mutterpass in which uh, invented in Germany, imported to Japan and combined with baby handbook. And this is a uh, home-made record. So most of you have your medical records in your hospital, but this handbook allows pregnant ladies and families to have your own data by yourself and control them, vaccination records and growth records, etc. Okay, how many babies having, no, they are not having no, pregnant ladies. How many pregnant ladies are having this? Okay, okay, okay. There are maybe uh, so three thousand. Three thousand. Three thousand. Okay, but uh, in Japan, uh, eight hundred thousand babies born. Okay, okay, three thousand. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Three thousand in the world or in the world? In the world. Okay. Okay, please. Uh, okay, as you know, here are YouTube and uh, other social uh, things, and also doctors are there, and there are our grandmas and mothers with their experience, and they can uh, teach us how to behave during our pregnancy or how to take care of babies. And uh, actually, there is not needed uh, so many handbooks like this. Oh, okay. That's my own okay. Opinion. Thank you. Your conversation uh, remind me my conversation with uh, Dr. Jim Kim, uh, ex-president of World Bank. Yeah, when, when I have a drunk with him uh, before his retirement, he, he said exactly the same argument. Yes, and I also challenged the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations of the same conversation by showing uh, uh, the Arabic handbook to him when uh, he visited Tokyo. Uh, but he said, just thank you. <laughs> 20 million. 20 million. So, uh, so don't forget that lady to give you a mark A, eh? <laughs> uh, okay? We, we shall talk about it. Okay, okay. Okay. You remember her face, no? You should remember her face. <laughs> but I'm leaving here. <laughs> That's the point. 
<laughs> okay, it's a lot to him. Sorry, sorry. So one out of seven babies and pregnant ladies are enjoying the usefulness of this one. I don't want to be narrowly proud of this sort of made-in-Japan type propaganda. As she said, we have so many, so many interesting and useful products. And in most so-called developing countries, developed countries, they are not using this handbook. It is true, it is true. For example, in Europe, only Dutch is using. And the other countries are not so much familiar with this one. And in case of the United States, only Utah State is using. And other 50 states are not using this handbook. It's true. So you, what your argument is right. So, but my point is that, my point is not for cheap advertisement of Japanese cooperation, but my point is about the versatility of this trick or system and the shareability of information and the ownership and the empowerment factors. This is not at all the only solution for improve the ownership of pregnant ladies and families. This is not at all mm, the best way uh, compared to other systems. But this might be one way to sensitize families, pregnant ladies, promote them, urge them to go to antenatal care, postnatal care, and uh, check up vaccination records by themselves. Yes, so it's all up to you, and it's all up to your government. Fortunately, around uh, 17 or 18 years ago, one government official from your country dispatched to Japan and found this one in Japan. And 15 years passed, some another uh, your government official came to Japan and we vindicated the usefulness of this one. And they persuaded your Ministry of Health to ask Japanese government and JICA to scrutinize the possibility of sharing this information. This is a current stage. We are not on a decided position but uh, this kind of thing might be a good example for sharing information, increasing sensitivity of ownership in a very scarce, resource scarce setting. And anyway, this handbook is, uh, if, even if you can forget this handbook, if you invest more on babies, if you invest more on the dignity and the safety of babies and mothers, you could have better babies, healthier babies, and the pregnant ladies and the families could have better dream, better expectation for the future, bringing a peace-loving one. That's kind of, how to say, good circulation of psychology between uh, individuals and people and community and the country could create a world. So when we say peace building or better governance, it's not only about uh, a direct issue of having legal election or something like that. Most basically, let us see better smile of babies that could result in uh, the brighter future of your country and of yourself. That is what I saw in Japan. Although I was born in a very, very miserable poor family, but uh, yes, so of course my parents use this handbook and uh, uh, one of my honorable, respected uh, friend of 
some royal family, they are used also exactly the same one. And uh, that kind of a system brought me up to talk to you today for the future of this country. And I feel very happy. And uh, Georgi san, what shall we do? Shall we discuss something about that? Yes. We have an. Uh, yes, we can use 10 minutes for discussion. Okay. Okay, okay. I have plenty of time, but you don't have, no? uh, Okay, so uh, I, will, I will finish to talk to provoke your sleepiness, but uh, let us be awake, and uh, if you need some argument, uh, you're welcome to do so. So having listened to my modest presentation and a very basic one, you may have some questions, or you may have some counter-arguments, or you may have some, how to say, intriguing comments by yourself for the future of this country. I understand you are the leader of the country. So you will take on a dynamic, intellectual, and shareable lead for the country, like uh, dear Professor Gyorge. It's a model, role model for you. Okay, any, any question or any challenge for me? If you have an excellent question and if he notified, you, yeah, another A. <laughs> okay. We, we, we have slightly different ways to evaluate our students, but it is considerable. Considerable, ah, great. Yeah, diplomat. <laughs> okay. Any considerable question? <laughs> okay, please. Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. Arigato, it was thank really you. mesmerizing for me to listen to you. Mm. And I have this question. At the beginning of our lecture, I mentioned that democracy might not be as ideal as a lot of people imagine. But in case of Japan, uh, what could be the most significant drawback of democracy? Uh, yeah. And this is a quite purely personal opinion. Eh? And uh, everything, everything I said is Yes, okay, talking about the current situation, Japan is too much saturated. In the name of democracy, we need to pass, overcome millions of millions of procedures. So even for the slight change for improvement for the sake of people, we need enormous energy to change in the name of democratic due process. Maybe I'm misunderstanding, but the uh, fact is that we are very much weak on having drastic change in a very much speedy way. This might not be the defect of democracy, rather this is the illness of so-called matured successful society. But uh, this is one thing I popped up. And another thing is myopsy. The term of national title representative for upper house, six years, fortunately. But for lower house, since the prime minister has a right to make a resolution of dissolve the diet, I respond to him quickly, and then, uh, so we have two yeah. questions. Yeah. The first one was yeah. about democratization. Yeah, yeah, countries. okay. The second was about... Yeah, uh, let me respond right. to the second one. Yeah. Uh, we are anatomizing the positive element of handbooks, such as uh, continuum of care and uh, home ownership, etc., and uh, asking World Bank and uh, WHO, World Health Organization, they are very much responsible for standardizing the code of conduct and the systems of uh, political uh, system in the health sector. And uh, with collaboration of 
WHO, uh, they agree to vindicate the importance of a continuum of care and uh, home-based record, etc. And they have their own guidebook to vindicate the useful handbook. And the second approach is uh, having a co uh, knowledge co-sharing activities such as the global conferences annually, and uh, daily we are uh, exchanging our uh, opinions and uh, lessons learned. For example, Indonesia is the largest country where uh, the most uh, a variety of handbooks are used, and Palestine, they are pro providing, uh, how to say, electronic handbook as well, and the crowd type handbook as well. And Afghanistan is in a very difficult situation. They are also struggling to nationalize these handbooks. So there are different experiences shared and contextualized to each countries. So this kind of thing. I, I will explain to you later on. If you, and your question. I want to ask your opinion, but uh, if time allows, no, you can. Please, uh, just please, uh, okay. I, I want to ask your opinion as well. Yeah, 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 briefly. Uh, I'm not an expert. Yeah. Mm. So, of course, I'm not an expert, but mm. I do believe that there are some differences major differences in cultures mm. which allow one country to become successful mm. democracies mm. while others uh, can't achieve that. Mm. Okay, okay, thank you. When I was in uh, Congo, Kinshasa, uh, 35 years ago, uh, after the Cold War, uh, they have 400 political parties before the election. And uh, most of them uh, from tribe and from interest groups. But uh, we had to call them democratic election. And as I said, uh, without appropriate culture, maturity, or capability of people, democratic system would not be the best political system. Unfortunately, unfortunately. So there should be some sort of sequence for realizing mature and sustainable democracy. Even in the most mature and the strongest countries, if you have absolute narrow-minded value judgments, which could not accept other person's view, Democracy doesn't work. Democracy just promotes a kind of division of society in the name of democratic system. We just increase the tension between the different value judgment. So we should not be optimistic about the potential of democracy. Democracy is important, and I agree with Winston Churchill. Maybe the worst, but better than all the other. But in order that democracy be, to some extent, good for us, we need human resources, as I said. Learn it, intellectually modest, open-minded. Try to understand others. Try to pay due respect to the difference of cultures. If majority of society consists of those learned, highly intellectual, open mind, peace-loving people, that is a time for you to be proud of becoming a democratic country. I'm sure this country has a potential of this. And this country is moving for that. And you are the leader. And I hope you could realize that. Okay? Yeah. Um, thank you, Professor Toda. It was indeed a very interesting lecture. Um, I'm sure that our students enjoyed it a lot. And your perspective on the development, on the ways how to use human capital, how to embrace it, 
will be a very interesting discussion point, a very good food for thought for our students. Thank you for Thank this. Thank you. Um, I believe on behalf of the university, Dean Karasaniza would like to uh, make a few words and also to give a very modest gift from the university oh. to you. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Embassy of Japan to Georgia, Ambassador, thank you very much, and also Jaika for all the wonderful job you're doing in Georgia. Thank you for this. Thank you, Georgi. Thank you very much for your interesting lecture, and I got thank so you. many interesting and very different information about uh, the development um, of democracy in different countries. So thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Thanks for JICA for organizing such a wonderful event, and thanks for the ambassador. So thanks a lot. This is a small gift, just traditional Georgian gift that we sometimes give to, to our okay. dear guests. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you <laughs> so much. <laughs>